Good morning, class. Uh, today is October the 5th, so to, this is the video for October the 6th. And we're first going to go over the quiz. And uh, like I said in the announcement, I was pretty happy with the results of the quiz. Um, uh, I'm going to go over uh, half the problems where people had some trouble, which included a problem one, which I would have hoped people would have gotten because um, you know, energy is force times distance. Energy is also equal to one half mv squared. And energy is also equal to, um, I mean, watts <laughs> times time. Uh, so the, the answer was D, all of the above. And, um, this is, you know, for this, for this, for, for this course to have a, at least uh, the minimal successful outcome for a student, um, they should be able to answer this one correctly. So I was a little disappointed that six people got this wrong. All right, let's move on. Number two, actually, six people got wrong too, and I kind of expected that. Uh, here the problem was you have a spring. All right and its height is h, and you put a little weight here, or a little thing there, and you compress it downward so that the spring is uh, half its height. And then uh, you let go, and you want to know how high it goes. And, and so basically the problem is that the potential energy of a spring is one half k x squared, and so if you compressed it h over two, one half k h over two squared, which is one half k h squared over or one eighth k h squared, and so the the answer was b. And um, What's happening here, of course, is that you, you, you hold it down, and when you let go, I mean, assuming nothing else goes wrong, uh, the spring goes flying up, that potential energy gets converted 100% to kinetic energy by the time it reaches here. So at this point, um, the mass has kinetic energy equal to that. And so this then, that potential energy gets converted completely into kinetic energy, and then as it goes upward, it can, gets converted back into potential energy versus gravity of MGH. So I hope, um, I hope people were able to piece that together and go through that um, and, and that that one was clear. Okay, um, <clears throat> three. So three windmill, okay, I was a little disappointed also um, that, that six people got this wrong because of course, uh, you know, the power in a windmill was one half rho v cubed, and so if the, if the wind is four times stronger, four cubed is 64. And of course then the answer is C. All right, um, going on, number four. So this, is, this was meant to, again, reinforce your uh, understanding or um, just sort of fluency of the idea that if you have any sort of reaction whether it's nuclear or chemical, where reactants turn into products, and you release energy, okay, that that energy is equal to the binding energy of the products minus the binding energy of the reactants. And, uh, and you refer to this chart here. This was the, the binding energy per nucleon. And it did something like this. Where out here you had uranium. Of course over here you have hydrogen and helium. Um, and so inside of a star, right, when, you know, our own sun, the, our own star, um, is currently fusing hydrogen into helium and releasing lots of energy uh, through that change in binding energy. And um, 
as stars get older and they run out of hydrogen, they start uh, fusing the lighter elements together and they keep fusing and fusing until you reach here, the top, because um, then when the only that's left is that, it can't fuse, it can't do anything to result in more energy because it's the most bound thing, and that's iron. So the answer was um, C. Okay, and um, and then finally we get to number eight. And so for number eight, I'm going to erase this and put it over there since that'll lead into our discussion of nuclear energy. Okay, and eight, um, you know, what do you need to for a nuclear reactor? Slow neutrons. I was a little disappointed here too that, that six people, no, four people got this wrong. So not that many. Uh, because basically um, you have a uranium nucleus and so some neutron comes flying around and has to get captured by that. So that neutron has to slow down. And um, that leads us into our discussion uh, of nuclear power. Um, all right, and um, let me do it that way so we know what's going on here. Um, uh, anyway, the answer was B then. All right, so before we get into nuclear power, I'm going to do a little bit of an aside, and I hope it all works out. Um, and I'm going to do this very carefully uh, so this to not disrupt my focus. All right, let's see if I can remove that one and turn on the projector. And I know you can't see it well, but the problem is that um, I have to I have to keep the lights on or else I lose my focus because I've already gone through this. So this is the same as, as, as the chart in your book. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, uh, this is uh, for the year 2019. The one in your the one in your current notes is for 2018. So you can use that to see how it's changed. Uh, this is uh, electrical generation in the country. And, and the reason uh, we're bringing it up is because we're now going to start talking about uh, nuclear power and solar power and wind power. And those are all electrical generators. And in your um, spaghetti chart, uh, it, it sort of lists them as converting. But it doesn't really make sense to talk about you know, quads of wind. Um, it only makes sense to talk about how much electrical generation there is by wind. So um, let's just you know look at this real quick. So you so you have your bearings here. Um, okay, in the year 2019. Uh, now what this refers to, 474 gigawatts, is the average power generation um, by all electrical power plants in the United States, meaning uh, it fluctuates, uh, you know, sometimes it may be, you know, 300 gigawatts, and sometimes it may be uh, 500 gigawatts, but, but basically um, it averages 474. And of that 474, this is the breakdown. And what you can see, first of all, is for coal, that it keeps going down, um, and natural gas keeps going up. If you compare this with 2018, uh, that coal went down and natural gas went up, and and so this this conversion or or, or displacement of coal-fired power plants with natural gas-fired power plants is continuing to happen, and it's basically a result of the fact that uh, horizontal drilling and fracking has lowered the price of natural gas to be roughly the same as, as coal on a per energy basis, and it's just simply too much easier to uh, operate a um, a natural gas fire plant. All right, and um, 
Okay, so this chart is interesting because um, it shows uh, how wind power has been increasing and now is, is close to 35 gigawatts. Uh, so it's becoming, uh, actually, wind is higher than hydroelectric now. I just noticed that. And uh, here's solar, and we'll talk more about that in the next lecture uh, going up. And then these other sources here, which haven't changed much in years, including geothermal, um, which stays you know, a little bit below 2 gigawatts. So you know, this shows where you get your electricity in this country and, um, and how it's changing, which is the main dynamic. There are, there are sort of three main dynamics here. Um, the displacement of coal fire plants with natural gas uh, and, the, and the vast increase in wind and solar taking place. Now buried in all this is nuclear. And you can see it hasn't changed, it hasn't changed in 30 years, uh, practically. It's around 90 gigawatts, um, so that's basically around 20% uh, of the total. 92 divided by 474, maybe 18%, I don't know the exact number. Um, and, and so in your final project, that number there, 92, will be a number that you will put in. And so you need to understand now, okay, uh, what the, the whys and wherefores of why that number might change. So let's see if I can keep everything going here. So nuclear power. And, uh, you know, this is it going on here. U-235 captures a slow neutron, and it releases three neutrons, okay, and they can cause subsequent reactions. And so the idea is that um, of those three neutrons, you, uh, you, you don't want all three to... <laughs> If, if, if all three of those cause a subsequent reaction, then you get a nuclear explosion. So obviously we don't want that. Um, you want the, um, the, uh, the, the, the fraction um, of those neutrons. Well, the way, I mean, I won't, write, I won't try to write down an equation because it'll just get confusing. But, but of those three, you want like 0.9 of them to cause a subsequent reaction. You don't want greater than one. If more than one of those causes a subsequent reaction, okay, one, 1 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1, you know, 100 million times is a big number. And so you want it a little bit below one of those. And so how do you do that? Well, um, you build a nuclear reactor. And, and the simplest nuclear reactor is, is um, a water moderated reactor, and it's basically a tank. Um, with nuclear fuel rods, and I'll draw them like this. So that's uranium uh, fuel rods. And they have about 3% U-235. Um, 3.5 percent. And um, you know, um, we got to slow those neutrons down. So what do we do? Um, well, I can't draw you know like wavy line here. There's basically there's water, H2O, and and so. Um, that water, you know, here's a pump. Um, that water uh, comes off here. It's really hot. Um, essentially, it, it's it's uh, superheated water, and um, and so it can create subsequently steam in a secondary cycle. Um, and we're not. We'll get into that later. But for now, we want to understand how this reactor works which is you have the fuel rods that are really hot and you have the water that um, slows down the neutrons. Um, and, 
in order to control the reaction, you have control rods. No, I'll just draw them like this. Okay. Control rods. And they absorb neutrons. So, um, the idea here is that um, the nuclear fuel rods are, you know, of course, uh, having these uh, nuclear react fission reactions. The water, okay, the way to think about water, it's mainly the protons. They don't absorb neutrons. They just slow them down through, you know, um, scattering, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when a neutron hits in, it's a proton, it just starts slowing, slowing down. But the idea is these control rods, which are usually boron, uh, absorb the neutrons. And so by inserting them into the nuclear pile up and down, you absorb some of these neutrons. And so you keep that, um, that fraction uh, of, of N uh, right around where you want it to be, of course, below one, uh, so that you just generate a lot of heat, but you don't have um, a nuclear explosion, which we've got. All right, so you know that's how this works. Now off to the side here, um, we're going to get back to that. We want to calculate uh, for your homework problem. Uh, so if you take uranium ore, it is 0.7 percent U-235. The rest is U-238. Um, and a fuel rod gets enriched 5x to 3.5%. All right. In the reactor, um, over the life of a fuel rod, 3% gets converted uh, of the U-235. Now, why is that? Well, um, I mean, it just has to be that that once 3% of the U-235 in the, react, in the, in the fuel rod has uh, reacted, um, the fuel rod is, is, is no longer, I mean, it's, it's becoming difficult to control the reaction because basically you have to bring out the control rods and, and, you know, you, you, you don't want, you know, there's a dynamic range of those control rods. And so once 3% is converted, that fuel rod's done, basically. All right, and we can use this to determine the BTU per kilogram of uranium ore, which is, you know, um, uh, this stuff here, uh, and uh, and so basically how we're going to do that is we're going to use E equals mc squared. Now, um, when you have the reaction U two thirty five goes to uh, like boron, or I'm sorry, uh, barium and krypton and three neutrons plus energy. The way to calculate the energy is because um, this has about um, 0.7 million electron volts um, less binding energy. So that is the energy released per nucleon. And we can use that um, N equals mc squared to calculate how much of the mass of that U-235 was converted, uh, went away basically in the reaction. And, and that's basically taking um, uh, E equals mc squared, so delta M is equal to E over c squared. Okay, and E is 0.7 times 10 to the sixth electron volts. You know how to convert that times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 EV per joule. 
I'm sorry, dual for EV. Um, and you divide that by C squared, and C is 2.9979 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. And so if you, if you plug all that in, you get uh, 0.00075. That is, um, uh, I'm sorry, one more step. You get 1.246 uh, times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. Okay, so let's look at that. So E equals mc squared. So the energy released is the change in mass, okay, um, times c squared. So I can turn that around and calculate the change in mass as the energy divided by c squared. All right, and so you take um, the, the change, uh, the energy per nucleon, 0.7 million electron volts, convert that into joules, divide that by c squared, and you know the units work out now because you know how to do problem one of the quiz. And so it works out to, um, per nucleon, uh, 1.476 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms of each nucleon, of each neutron and proton was converted. So delta M over M, the fractional reduction in mass is 1.24 times 6 times 10 to the minus 30 kilogram over the mass of a neutron and a proton. Now, the mass of a neutron and a proton are slightly different, but you can approximately just use an AMU. And that is 0 0.00075. So that is the fraction mass loss. Um, meaning, for example, if I started, if, if in, my re in my reactor, my fuel rod, okay, all right, let's, let's do the subtraction, one minus that, okay, the mass of a fuel rod when uh, done, when you pull it out after three, you know, um, is is that much is is point zero 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 nine or uh yeah, point nine 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 two five okay um it's it's that much lighter than when you put it in all right let's move on because we want to calculate the b2 per kilogram of our uranium ore all right and so basically how you do that is that um you take uranium ore, uh, you enrich it, 5x, to the fuel rod. All right, you react it um, until 0 0.003 is converted. And so what you get is that um, of the original ore, 0 0.006 of that has mass converted to energy. And so delta M overall is that times the fractional mass change uh, per nucleon. So, you know, this amount. So it's 0 0.00075 times 0 0.006, which is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6. Of my original ore, okay, by the time I take that and enrich it um, and, then, and then react it, and then pull it out, the fractional change in mass, it is that much lighter. 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6. 
And, and so I can use that to calculate now E of one kilogram or is equal to, okay, they have one kilogram of ore. Now, um, uh, I want to, this is something called yellow cake. Uh, there's an error in the uh, calculation here. I'm not taking into account the fact that this is an, uh, an oxide and I'm, I'm ignoring the oxygen atoms here. Um, I want to, you want to make clear, because your homework problem, uh, the second homework problem, I think the second one, is to uh, calculate, you know, given amount of dirt with the parts per million of uranium, um, what, um, uh, what amount of energy you get. Okay, so um, this is not the quote unquote dirt. I mean, um, we'll talk about uranium mining if we have time at the end of this lecture. This is, this is the purified ore, all right, that is 0.7% U-235, just to make that clear. So of that one kilogram of ore, all right, you have converted uh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7 times C squared, all right, and then I'll multiply times 1,055 or divide by 1,055 Joule per uh, BTU. All right, and if you do that, you will get 380 million BTU per kilogram. All right, so let's let's do an aside over here. Okay, because this matters for your homework problem. Um, here's, here's, you know, here's, here's a uranium field. All right. And so you basically just scoop, you know, <laughs> I can't draw, uh, you know, you scoop this stuff up and it's dirt that contains some fraction, like let's say, mm, e.g. Um, 0.001. Uh, U-235. All right, the point being that, okay, uranium is not like gold, okay? You don't find nuggets of it lying around. If there were nuggets of it lying around, it would have reacted a long time ago. Um, you, you find, like, dirt uh, places on Earth where, um, you know, fields of dirt have more or less percentage. And so, for example, a lot of uranium mining fields have one part per thousand. All right, so the, the uranium dirt uh, with that, right, that if you, if you dig up 1,000 kilograms has one kilogram ore, all right, and that has 380 million BTU. Okay, again, I want to reiterate this for your homework problem, okay, imagine you find some field of, you know, now how does that get here? Okay, we, we went through this in the beginning of the course, uranium, the energy in uranium comes from, you know, supernova events. I was just reading an article how they have determined that uh, there was a supernova event that, that occurred near, uh, near Earth two and a half million years ago, but, but the uranium on our planet uh, uh, came well before the formation of the solar system. Uh, other supernova uh, nuclear uh, reactions um, caused fusion of very high weight elements and, and so um, the resulting in uranium. And when the earth formed, there's a certain amount of uranium got, that got mixed up in it. And so uranium is just sort of distributed throughout the planet. And um, uh, uh, some places, like most places, it's like a tiny, tiny amount. Like if you went out into the, uh, the quad in, at the University of Delaware and you dug up, you might find a few uranium atoms, <laughs> very few. Um, but uh, um, on a part per mass, and this is always in, part, uh, in mass ratios, um, a, 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 a well, you know, it's called a placer, a good field of uranium might have on a mass basis, um, one part per thousand, 
So if you dug up that uranium dirt there, okay, a thousand kilograms would result in one kilogram ore, and that would have 380 million. So what the problem, what the homework problem is, is, okay, how low can that be? Okay, can it be 0 .0001, 0 .0, you know, what can it be and still be profitable to mine that dirt? You see, in this example, that dirt has 380,000 BTU per kilogram, right? Because I had to dig up 1,000 kilograms of it to get one kilogram of ore, all right? So the question is, okay, I can go... I can go lower, okay, how much lower can I go before it's not profitable to dig up that dirt? And this is a critical question because as we'll see from the homework, um, uh, how much uranium there is on the planet, the question is, okay, how much uranium is profitable to mine? And, and so that's what you're supposed to answer in the homework question. All right, now, um, In the book, or in the notes, okay, I opine that if this is the Earth, okay, that let's say, um, we're going to guess that on an average basis, all right, there is 0 0.008 parts per million. All right, which basically means that if you dug up a million kilograms, any on average in the Earth, that you would come up with 0 0.008 kilograms of uranium ore. All right, and if that's true, and we can dig, <laughs> I mean, this is a made up problem, but uh, if we can dig down one-third of a kilogram okay it's a made-up problem but if you took that number basically you took that volume and and multiply it times the the uh, the density of the earth what you would come up with is that um, within that surface one-third of a oh, kil kilometer one-third of a kilometer deep it's made up a number you would come up with 10 to the 13 kilograms of uranium ore. And you can look in the notes to go through that. Now this is a made up problem. Your homework is not made up, right? Your homework is, 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 a, is a real analysis of, of how much uranium there are there is on the planet at different concentrations. And you are to figure out how much of that you can get profitably. But if we just make up this sort of made up problem here, um, that, that, you know, we're sort of just going to say question mark that, that, that the Earth has the same average percentage of uranium as meteorites that we find coming down from the solar system, that we would be able to get 10 to the 13 kilograms. So if you take 10 to the 13 kilograms times uh, 3.8 times 10 to the 8 BTU per kilogram, right? That's equal to 3.8 times 8 plus 13, 10 to the 21 BTUs. All right, which is um, divided by this is is uh, three quads. That is, this simple analysis says that there should be. Uh, 3.8 million quads equivalent of uranium that we can get if we just mine the surface of the planet. Um, and it's made up, of course, but it gives you the idea, and you'll see from your homework problem, there's a lot of uranium. And and um, when you when you you might read articles where you see that um, you know some people uh, op uh, make it a, have an opinion that there's not that much uranium. Well, that's because they're basing that off of, I erased it, you know, uh, 0 0.001 uh, uranium ore. Um, whereas if you can go down to, you know, as you see in your homework, you know, 
one, two, three, four, five. If you can go down to one part per million, well, then there's a lot more. And so the question of how much uranium is on the planet is the question how much is, uh, at what concentration is profitable to mine, and, and then you figure that out, and that's what you're doing in your homework problem. But this simple analysis gives you 3.8 million quads. Of course, we only use 100 quads per year. So that's, um, you know, drop two of the zeros, 380,000 years. So the simple analysis says there's a lot of uranium, enough to power our society for forever, essentially. Um, and, and so that's great, you know, I mean, um, so let's just stand back from this a little bit. And again, you have your homework problem where, you're, well, where you will um, look into this in more detail. But, but I mean, this analysis, and, and this is just uranium. This is not even talking about other rare radioactive elements like thorium or things like that to undergo fission. Um, let alone more exotic things like breeder reactors, which we won't go into here. Uh, because they're not considered commercial, because um, uh, you can make plutonium with it, which is a, uh, a higher grade bomb making material. And so uh, no one is using breeder reactors uh, in, on, on Earth. Um, all reactors are, are based on U-235. But this is saying that in principle, we should be able to mine enough uranium to power our society for 380,000 years, just with nuclear power. Of course, all we can make is electricity, um, but uh, we can electrify transportation. And, and this is a major proposal of environmentalists, uh, which you know, sounds um, sort of counterintuitive, but uh, because global warming um, is, the, is what it is, and nuclear power doesn't emit CO2, right, because the reaction <laughs> This is not a chemical reaction, this is a nuclear reaction, there's no CO2 emitted, um, that um, the nuclear ification, I think that's the right word, uh, of society has been promoted as a way to solve climate change. Um, and, you know, we should be able to do it. All right, so why isn't it being done? Well, let's, um, let's, let's talk about problems. Actually, I guess I didn't need to erase this, but um. so let's talk nuclear reactors. All right, first of all, there's 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 uh, there's safety. Safety. Actually, let me put it over here. Safety. Exclamation mark. And and there's 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 sort of three events that occurred in history um, regarding this. In 1979, there was the Three Mile Island. Reactor coolant leak. And you can read all about this if you go on the internet. Um, um, basically, what happened is, is that um, there was a valve failure. Um, this, this coolant got released into the environment. And, and so, um, you know, radiation from the reactor was released into the, the, react, uh, the environment. Um, now, what happens when something happens bad in the reactor. Well, uh, you have what is called a, um, a scram event. I lost my focus. I'm going to turn on more lights. There we go. Great. Okay. I'm going to stand up for decide not to. Okay. So, um, if something goes wrong, 
goes wrong. Scram. <laughs> uh, I forget what scram stands for. Uh, but basically a scram is you're, you're operating this nuclear reactor and you're keeping it going and all of a sudden you get a cooling, uh, a coolant leak. And, and you're like, oh no, uh, <laughs> what do I do? Well, what you do is you have, I mean, it's almost like a dead hand switch. There's a release mechanism that, boom, you push a button, there's a big red button in the control room. <laughs> and then when you push that, those control rods all get fully inserted into the reactor. And, and so um, uh, it basically absorbs all the neutrons, it shuts down the reaction. And in this incident, uh, A, scram worked. And B, of that coolant leak, there was no measurable radiation. It could not be measured. Um, they tried to. Um, uh, the, the, you know, it's what it sounds like. There's a, a river around this thing. It's an island in the middle of a river, and um, you know they 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 tried very very hard to measure the radiation, and there was none. So as far as an accident goes, it, it was probably the most minimal accident you could possibly have. The system worked. The reactor shut down. Nothing really bad happened. Unfortunately, three weeks earlier. There was the movie, The China Syndrome, which was a movie about an accident in a nuclear reactor where scram did not work. The reactor core uh, continued to overheat until it melted through the containment system. And, you know, the, the word China here comes from that it's going to melt all the way down through the core of the earth and go, you know, it's a, a little ridiculous. Um, I don't know, know where that terminology came from, and that's where the word China comes from here. Uh, we're on the opposite side of the planet. And so it was like, it's going to be so hot that it's going to melt all, and this, this, this hot mass of uranium just going to go all the way through the center of the earth and to the other side. Um, of course, that didn't happen. But, but you know, uh, the timing was, was exquisite. Um, you know, millions of people had watched this movie, which, of course, you know, scared a lot of people about nuclear power. And then this happened, and everyone, and the and nuclear industry in this country was basically shut down. Uh, there were no new reactors produced after that date, even though it was a minimal reaction. All right, let's move on. Um, 1986. Chernobyl. Okay, did anyone uh, over? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Did anyone watch uh, uh, Chernobyl on, on HBO? Uh, great, so great miniseries. Um, uh, very, you know. Okay, uh, if you watched it carefully and you went to episode five, you know what happened there. Uh, Chernobyl was a reactor where, okay, the. Um, there were, there were essentially, there were the fuel rods and the moderator was graphite. I can't even draw this. Um, I, well, I'm, because uh, the way I have to draw it, I, I'm going to, okay, so let me draw the fuel rods. So those are the fuel rods. And I won't draw how the moderator, uh, the moderator was graphite. Which graphite carbon, um, in, in your sort of billiard ball collision model, it's not a, you know, it's a light element, um, not as good as hydrogen, uh, I would think. And, and it also, um, we went through this before the quiz, um, in, uh, in, a, in a water moderated reactor, the water is also the coolant, and so if you lose coolant, which is bad, 
you also lose moderation, and so the reaction slows down. Um, so there's a natural sort of fail-safe. Whereas for graphite, um, it's just there. I mean, if you lose coolant, the graphite's still moderating the reaction. The, the reaction, there's no negative feedback. The reaction still proceeds. That wasn't the problem. Um, the problem was, and I'm going to draw this upside down, they were doing a test um, of a, a low load condition. Uh, basically, um, what happens if you have to tamp down the nuclear reactor to very, very low levels? And so they had all the fuel rods, uh, you know, except, you know, maybe a couple. And, you know, I'm not drawing this to scale. There's, uh, there's hundreds of fuel rods, or uh, control rods. So these are the fuel rods, and these are the control rods. Um, and, and so they were doing a test. This is a low power test. Um, and, and so because of the nature of the test, they had the control rods um, mostly out of the reactor. They were really, you know, trying to run the, uh, the reactor at very, very low power. Um, and, and so, you know, um, the control rods were, most of them were outside of the core, actually. All right, and so what happened, okay, you, you have to go through the, I really encourage everyone to watch this, that, that mini-series. It's really a, a very nice uh, historical, uh, and it seems very accurate, um, including te technically accurate. Something went wrong, and um, the reactor started overheating in this test. And if you watch the movie, it's the whole drama is what happened, okay? Because there was an explosion. And it's becoming more and more apparent that it was actually a nuclear explosion, a very small one that occurred followed by uh, a subsequent uh, chemical reaction explosion that occurred uh, in the reactor. But they had most of the fuel rods out, and the whole drama of the series and the event and everything was, okay, why didn't they scram? Okay, uh, they, you know, if you, if you watch the movie, the, the, the head investigator is, is interviewing, you know, one of the uh, technicians at the reactor and saying, oh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, this this is really awful what you did. You didn't hit scram. Why didn't you hit scram? And the technician, who's, I mean, unfortunately lying there on a deathbed, is saying, yes, I did. I hit the button. We hit scram. Okay. Um, and and the, um, you know, the investigator, you know, can't believe him because if he had hit scram, the react, you know, the control rods would have flown in there and everything would have been fine. Um, what they determined was that, and I, I don't quite get this. These control rods, which, like I say, are usually boron, had graphite tips. So the tip of each control rod, and I, and I, I never got exactly why, whether that was some just sort of manufacturing um, uh, thing or something like that, but. Uh, because so many of the control rods were outside of the core, when they hit scram, in a millisecond, what happened first was graphite entered the core, not the boron or the control rods. Um, and graphite is the moderator. So in the first, you know, they had so many fuel control rods out, in the first sort of millisecond or less, really, as they were, as, as when the guy hit scram and they were inserting themselves in, it actually caused more moderation to occur. I erased my neutrons. Oh no, there's my neutrons. And so this briefly went above one because you know uh, the number of these that are captured, right, is is based upon how well they're moderated. And and so. Because of the graphite tips of the control rods, which again, that's something I never quite understood why they made them that way. When the guy hit scram in the in the first millisecond, it actually went supercritical. At least that's what appears happened. And so you had basically a, a small nuclear explosion. 
And that was followed by a much larger chemical explosion when the sea, when the water rushed in and everything like that. But um, that was this is this is very bad. <laughs> this was a bad accident. Um, you know, I, again, uh, I can't convey here uh, uh, how bad it was or could have been. Um, you know, you, you watch the mini series. It's a great mini series. You know, it describes how you know. They were clearing the this, 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 the graphite uh, material um, from the roof of the reactor, and and basically workers or soldiers had to go up there and for they had 30 seconds right to shovel this stuff off the roof, um, and you know then they had met their lifetime exposure <laughs> of radiation. It was horrible. Um, it could have been much worse. And um, it's a great series. Please, well, please watch it, and it'll give you an idea. Now, okay, so now it was a bad design. It was an unknown problem. The technicians didn't know this. <laughs> Apparently, they didn't know that the control rods had graphite tips. It was some free, some, some kind of secret, and so it was a bad environment, a bad testing environment, a bad design. Just everything was bad going on here. So this, you know, kind of can't happen again. Um, all right, moving along. We now have 2011 in Japan, uh, Fukushima. Fukushima. All right, now we're coming close to modern time here. And um, what happened here was that there was a uh, earthquake. Tsunami. Can't spell tsunami. Uh, tidal wave. And, and, and basically uh, the reactor uh, main containment was breached. And seawater flooded into the core. Um, now. They apparently did everything right. They did scram. The uh, you know uh, everything should have been fine, except um, their fuel rods had zirconium casing. And now why? Okay, there's, there's a lot of details uh, about the material science of these fuel rods. Of course, they get very hot, um, but uh, zirconium uh, reacts at height with hot seawater to produce hydrogen. And so this plus seawater, hot seawater, produce hydrogen, which then exploded. And uh, uh, there was a, a release of um, essentially um, um, the water into the environment. Okay, the numbers here are, I looked them up, um, 125 uh, microsieverts per hour. Within, they measured that um, just after the reaction, and for a long time thereafter, um, it resulted in, uh, within 25 kilometers, uh, a radiation level of 125 microsieverts. Okay, just to give you perspective, uh, in an airplane, okay, uh, look that up, that's three. Okay, so yeah, it was bad, okay, um, um, but just to, you know, give you perspective here, it's it's like around you know 40 times higher than 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 the exposure rate you get flying in an airplane. Um, so I mean, how bad is bad? Okay, um, uh, the, the 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 indication are that there was an increased uh, risk of cancer. I don't think it's been long enough that they've determined if uh, if they can directly attribute any cancer deaths to the radiation. So, you know, we sort of had, you know, kind of a, uh, a nothing thing here, kind of a bigger thing here, and a really big thing here. I mean, these people died right away, and late years later, there were, I mean, thousands of people that died basically because of this. Um, this was, you know, 
just bad design and engineering all around. This is good engineering, except for the zirconium coating. That's a problem that can be can be corrected. So I just wanted to give you a, a perspective of um, the main issue, or one of the, there's two main issues. The the one main one of the main issues, which is okay, are they safe? All right, we just determined there's enough uranium uh, to power fission reactors for you know 100,000 years or whatever. Um, at our current energy needs. And, and so why aren't we doing it? Well, because it's perceived to, as unsafe. Or why aren't we doing it more? And, and, and the, the presentation here is that accidents have happened. Um, can, can reactors be redesigned to be great, more safe? Absolutely. And, and so this has become a question as far as the safety issue the direct safety issue of, okay, my read on it is at some point, um, the society in general will, will be more scared of, of climate change than they will be of radiation events that might occur due to a reactor failure. And, you know, um, what I, I mean, why am I telling you all this? Well, so that you know, and, and number two, so that in your final project, if you put down um, a high degree of uh, nuclear energy in the year 2050, um, you should address the safety issue. Uh, okay, um, so that safety is one issue. The other issue is nuclear waste. And that's your other homework problem. And basically, okay, uh, I raised it, but you know those fuel rods, um, once they undergo three percent conversion of the U-235, uh, they're considered used, spent, and and so um, they get hauled off of the reactor and put somewhere. And where they're put is next to the reactor, basically in the parking lot. And so basically, um, this is your homework uh, problem too. Uh, which is that, okay, here's my reactor, all right, uh, you know, nuclear reactor. And, you know, what happens is that these fuel rods come on and they're, and they're put in like, you know, big caskets, you know, concrete casks or something like that. And so um, your homework problem is not to do any uh, first principles calculations here. I want you to go, to go to at least one nuclear reactor site, use Google Maps, and look for these waste sites, uh, waste casks, and, and try to determine based upon whatever information you can find, you know, how many are added per year and what the um, what the additional square footage required, and so basically, I said you, they could use 50 acres. So this is what's happening right now: nuclear waste is piled up on the on the reactor site, and I'm saying if you have 50 acres per site, how long can that continue? Uh, for a given nuclear reactor. And I don't care which one you look up, but find one um, and tell me what the answer. I want to know the answer in years. How many years? How many years that can happen? And that's the other issue is, you know, so there's safety and that, that seems like that's a solvable issue. Um, and then there's the nuclear waste and that hasn't been solved in any sense other than Okay, you know, it's like, you know, if, you're, if, the, if the way that you dealt with your trash was, was simply to pack it up nice and neatly um, and, and put it in your backyard. <laughs> and, and so instead of, you know, uh, putting your garbage out for the garbage people to come pick up, uh, you decided that, well, the way you were going to handle, you know, your garbage was, you know, to pack it up neatly, maybe get one of those compactors and, and start piling it up outside. And, and so that's what they're doing. And the question is, well, 
how long can that continue, assuming they have 50 acres per site to do it. So that's the homework problem. It's not uh, sitting there with calculations and stuff like, uh, you know, equations and things like that. It's getting on Google Earth and looking and trying to figure out how fast this happens, going to websites and things like that. I want to know how many, you know, and you have to take into account basically that, okay, it's not just the area of each cask, it's, you know, the, the total square footage take up in each. So if it's like five casks per year and the way they're putting them in, each cask takes up, you know, I don't know, uh, 400 square feet, all right, then, you know, it's five times 400, 2,000 square feet per year, and then, you know, you divide that into 50 acres to come in to figure out how many years that can go on. And, uh, you know, we'll go through the answer. Okay, so the, the, this homework um, is due um, uh, a week from today. And, and so I will go through it in that day's lecture. Um, okay, so, so that's nuclear power. That's the extent to which uh, we're going to have video about it. We can talk about it more in the chat class tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and then we'll move on to, uh, to the next subject. Okay, that's it for today.